The Dicastery for Divine Worship and the Discipline of the Sacraments at the Vatican issued a document this week confirming and clarifying restrictions on the celebration of the traditional Latin Mass. What is the Vatican trying to achieve here? With analysis of this story and more, I'm joined by the Papal Posse, editor-in-chief of thecatholicthing.org, Robert Royal, and canon lawyer and priest of the Archdiocese of New York, Father Gerald Murray. And we have a special guest, liturgy expert and author of The Once and Future Roman Rite, returning to the Latin liturgy after 70 years in exile, Peter Kwasniewski also joins us. Gentlemen, thanks for being here. I need to start with this latest document, a so-called rescript, that uh, states the following regarding Pope Francis's uh, Guardians of the Tradition document and the celebration of the traditional Latin Mass. Here we go. It says there are dispensations specifically reserved to the Apostolic See. Here they are. The use of a parish church or the erection of a personal parish for the celebration of the Eucharist using the Missale Romanum of 1962, the old Latin rite. Uh, the granting of a license to presbyters ordained after the publication of Modo Proprio Traditiones Custodes to celebrate using the 62 Missale Romanum. And should a diocesan bishop have granted dispensations in the two cases mentioned above, he is obliged to inform the dicastery for the divine worship and discipline of the sacraments, which will evaluate the individual cases. Uh, that comes from uh, Arthur Cardinal Roche, who's the prefect of that congregation. Uh, Father Murray, it appears the Vatican is effectively doing away with the discretion of the local bishops in all aspects of the old Latin rite. What is being done here canonically? Well, in canon law, when Rome or the Pope issues a decree or an apostolic constitution, uh, the local bishop has the power, according to Canon 87, paragraph 1, to dispense from provisions uh, according to the pastoral need in his diocese. And in Traditionis Custodes, which was the apostolic constitution concerning the old, the traditional Latin Mass, the Pope said, don't use parish churches, don't create new parishes specifically for Latin Mass, and that priests who are ordained after this constitution you need to consult Rome before giving them permission. But it was consult. It wasn't get permission from Rome. Now that's all been changed. Mm -hmm. So this rescript is really new law, and it goes in the direction of depriving bishops of the rights they enjoy in canon law to make pastoral decisions based on what they see. Now, it's fascinating because, uh, you know, Traditionalis Custodes was issued on the basis of a survey in which we were told that there's a lot of dissatisfaction among the world's bishops about the traditional Latin Mass. But the fact that bishops were allowing it to continue in their diocese indicates the opposite. So I think this is a Roman right. effort, sad to say, to further marginalize, restrict, and banish Latin Mass people. And these are precisely a group of practicing Catholics who are very obedient. So I, I find this to be mm -hmm. very distressing and not according to what the Pope has always said, go out to the marginalized and help them. Yeah, Dr. Kwasniewski, um, as, as Father alluded to there, this really evolved from questions raised by the bishops who uh, charged that the congregation on the liturgy and Cardinal Roche had overstepped his authority here. Uh, the Pope is, is approving this. He's saying, no, he has that authority. How mm -hmm. dire is this? How grave is what Rome is attempting here? Well, it's, it's, it's a very serious matter because, first of all, the rescript is it's rather embarrassing because it's actually patching up uh, all of the problems that Cardinal Roche was creating by seizing authority in his own hands that he didn't actually have. I mean, this the canon lawyers have exhaustively shown that what when he was asking bishops not to use Canon 87 uh, or, or when he was telling them they weren't allowed to, he didn't actually have the authority to do that until this rescript. So it's already a, a sign of the haste and the, the kind of intemperate um, desire to, to act as quickly as possible to extinguish this perceived threat of the traditional mass Catholics. Um, and, and so even, I mean, the canon law is already in a certain amount of disarray. And I think we can see that the number of documents and the speed with which they're coming uh, is, you know, only gives evidence of what can what, what could be called a sort of... Um, uh, intemperate zeal, right, towards this minority of Catholics. 
Bob, your thoughts on why Pope Francis, and I guess Cardinal Roche by proximity, why do you think they have this obsession with a small group of pious, traditional, faithful Catholics drawn to a perfectly valid and ancient liturgy that the last two pontificates said is not only legitimate but desirable? What is driving this? Yeah, that's a very good question because the um, the explanation that we were given for why they had to engage in this limiting of the traditional Latin Mass is that they thought that the people who liked the traditional Latin Mass were a threat to the Church's unity. Um, <laughs> in, in my view, what, what they've been doing is excessive, and it's excessive in a, a particularly non-productive way. It's actually introducing a division that did not have to be there. there it's true that the, the traditional Latin Mass is very powerful, and I think that they recognize that by the fact that they've been, um, they've been seeking to uh, limit it even further with the, these uh, additional documents. I mean, in a funny way, the, the, the FBI document from my home state of Virginia that began to, to um, suggest that people who follow the traditional Latin Mass are potentially terrorists and, and you know, sort of homegrown mm -hmm. extremists, that, too, recognizes that the, the Mass is powerful. So it's powerful, but I don't see that it, it is a threat to Vatican II. It, I mean, it does actually encourage people to be critical of some pe things that people have claimed were Vatican II, but in many ways, I think it respects Vatican II, and it's a legitimate, a legitimate expression. It's a puzzle why they believe that this small but, but potent uh, form of the liturgy is simply mm -hmm. that, something that is simply intolerable. Yeah. Well, I, you, you know, Bob, I think you've hit on it. It is the vibrancy. It is the vitality. It's the young face of the church. Look, uh, I, I wonder whether any of these people have ever attended a Latin Mass. Uh, you know, I, I have one in a nearby parish to where we go to church, and I can tell you, when you know, if I don't hit it on time, you see floods of children and women in mantillas and daddies holding babies coming out. This is the future of the church. You go to most suburban parishes, you know, it looks like uh, sing-along time at the retirement home. I don't mean to insult anybody, but that's what it looks like. There's a handful of people, the pews are not filled, and there's no crackle. There's no energy or focus on God and, and, and sacrality in that room. There just isn't. Father, what does this say about the role of the bishop who is running the diocese? Where is the synodality here? Is anyone listening to these bishops who want to keep this mass option available to the faithful in his diocese? Well, this is the paradox of the papacy of Pope Francis, and it's a paradox because he came into the office saying he wanted a decentralized church, he wanted collegiality. Uh, then he started speaking about synodality, which means we walk together and we talk together and we listen to each other. The exact opposite is happening as regards to the Latin Mass. Bishops are being deprived of their right in canon law to make pastorally wise and sensitive decisions about how to apply restrictions that, quite frankly, uh, most bishops, at least in this country, uh, didn't think were necessary. I mean, when the pope issued the document, Traditionis Custodis, there was no, you know, uprising of approval and, let's say, expressions of joy coming from the bishops of the United States and or other countries saying, well, at last mm -hmm. now we can restore the unity of the church. In fact, it was just the opposite. He said, bishops are saying, why in the world would I want to evict mass-going Catholics who, as you say, are young, have children, are believers, why would I want to evict them from a parish church? My parish church, as many bishops will tell you, are pretty empty these days. And when people are going to Mass, why, why be hostile? So it is a paradox, but it's not just in this matter of liturgy. It's in other areas. The Pope has taken away from bishops the powers granted after the Council mm. in the Reform Code of Canon Law, having to do with religious institutes and starting diocesan orders, uh, there are all kinds of procedures mm -hmm. in which bishops are basically being told, Rome makes all the decisions, you have to implement that. That's not how an apostolic church deals with pastoral sensitivity and pastoral utility. Yeah, well, they went from, you know, the bishops in this new rescript, they're really cast as not uh, the guardians of tradition, but the guardians of restriction. I mean, they're restricted. You know, you have to abide by these restrictions. That's your job. Peter, there are 24 churches in communion with Rome, 24 rites, um, uh, you know, and, and I know there's a huge diversity of unique liturgies out there, again, in communion with Rome. 
Why is the Vatican so unconcerned with stamping out those rights in the name of unity, but so hyper-focused on this one ancient right upon which the whole enterprise, it seems to me, stands? Yes, indeed. It's a very good question. And, and it's, it's especially a good question because when you look at all of these different traditional rights, most of them are Eastern rights, but there are some in the West, too, like the Ambrosian right. They often have much mm -hmm. more in common with the traditional Latin mass than they do with the Novus Ordo. Um, the Anglican Ordinariate, for example, which is a type of the Roman rite, you might say, they celebrate Mass ad orientem. Uh, they use the Roman canon. They use uh, they use the chant. Um, they do and they and they use some the old offertory prayers, or at least that's an option that they're allowed to use. So there are many things that mm -hmm. that these other rites have in common. So what is the reason? I'm afraid to say, but I think it's true because you all you have to do is read what Cardinal Roach said when he spoke to San Anselmo, that that there is actually a group of people in power in the church right now who think that Vatican II changed the theology of the mass, changed the theology of the liturgy in such a profound way that the traditional Latin mass, which the church used for centuries and centuries, going back over a thousand years, that this is no longer compatible with the super dogma of Vatican II. Uh, to use an expression of Joseph mm. Ratzinger. And if that's what they think, and if that's what's really driving this, that would be a serious theological error. This is not really, I think, about pastoral issues. This is about theological mm -hmm. issues. Yeah, Bob, you know, I keep going, and Peter, I'm glad you brought that up. I keep going back to Pope Benedict's uh, correct observation. Um, uh, and this, from this came the reconciliation of what he called the extraordinary and the ordinary form of the Roman rite. He said what earlier generations held as sacred cannot be all of a sudden entirely forbidden or even considered harmful. You were just in Rome last week. What were you hearing regarding uh, the traditional Latin Mass? And recall that these are the same people, and I want to remind the audience, these are the same people in Rome who are pushing for a new Amazonian rite, which we covered during the last synod. Yeah, there was a lot of nervousness about what was happening. Some people were hoping in Rome that the, 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 the preliminary criticism, for the criticism prior to the actual publication of the rescript, might cause the Holy Father and Cardinal Roche to hesitate uh, in what they were going to do. As it turned out, of course, that, that wasn't the case. I think one of the things that, that is, is so very disturbing to a lot of people in Rome, and I, I think I would have to say in the United States as well, is that it gives the impression of that people who prefer that traditional Latin Mass, which you rightly say, Benedict said, cannot be simply declared you know, out of bounds because it, it was it was a holy right. expression of the faith in the past. But I think it, it puts people on the spot, whether it's bishops, whether it's parishes, whether it's individual priests, it kind of makes them look guilty until proven innocent, that they're going to have to yeah. submit requests to Cardinal Roach who's going to have to tell them either uh, yes or no. Now, we can hope that he's going to be generous, but I, I would have to say that all the indications are that if you do this, you're going to put yourself under suspicion. And it goes against the, the, the basic value that you're innocent until proven guilty. And in, in Benedict's eyes, you had the right to do this because it had always been recognized as a valid right. Right. Mm -hmm. By right of their ordination, they could celebrate, you know, this mass or 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 the Novus Ordo. It was a it was the up to the the celebrant, up to the priest himself. Um, I want to share with you a, an opinion tweeted by one of the U.S. bishops this week. Get your reactions. Um, th this is uh, Bish Bishop Tobin, and he says the way the Vatican is dealing with the traditional Latin mass does not seem to me to be the style of God. In quotes. Pope Francis himself has emphasized that those who are attached to the traditional Latin Mass should be, quote, accompanied, listened to, and given time. That's Bishop Thomas Tobin of Providence. Peter, um, your quick take on Tobin's thought here, and what of the inconsistencies in what seems to be a full court press against an ancient and valid form of the liturgy? Yes, well, Bishop Tobin is absolutely right. And in fact, if you look throughout all of the writings of Pope Francis, he is constantly saying things like that. Let me just give you a short example from September 26, 2021. The Pope wrote, the Holy Spirit does not want closedness. 
He wants openness and welcoming communities where there is a place for everyone. We are called to build an increasingly inclusive world that excludes no one. I mean, and you can, mm. as I say, you can find quotations like this all over the place. What is going on? Well, I mean, again, it, it, it looks rather sinister because if the Pope really believes these things, if he's not being hypocritical, then he must be saying those Catholics who are attached to ancient ways of doing things that they find more spiritually fruitful for themselves and their families and more productive, more fruitful of vocations, that there is something morally or doctrinally wrong about what they love, about what they're doing. Yeah. What does that tell us about the continuity of the Catholic Church over all of these centuries? That yeah. makes no sense. Yeah. Uh, Bob and or Father Jerry, I'm going to go to you and then I want to go to Bob. Why we talked about driving young people from the pews, but there's something else here that I want to touch on, and it is the parish setting. What Rome is really doing is saying, we don't want you in the parish setting. So they are creating a rupture, it seems to my eye, and then saying, look, clutching their pearls over the rupture that's happening. Well, you're driving these people from the parish setting and sending them underground. Isn't that what's happening, Father? Yeah, it's a basic violation of church order. There is no reason why any parishioner should be thrown out of his parish church. Absolutely none. Uh, the fact that Cardinal Roach and the Pope don't find the old mass to be, you know, useful or fruitful or for them, you know, a good expression of, of how we should pray, that opinion you can have. I think it's not a good opinion. I would like to discuss it with them. But for, you know, please, for the love of God, don't turn around and tell, you know, a family of 10 who's been going to the Latin mass for the last 30 years that you and your children have to get in your car and drive somewhere else because you're not going to be able to have mass at your parish church where your children were baptized and made their communion and all the rest. This makes absolutely no sense. It's a persecution of Latin mass Catholics, plain and simple. And it can't be justified mm. by saying, well, this is going to help promote the mission of the church. This is damaging the church. It absolutely is. And in the United States, where there's a great love for the Latin Mass, I think most bishops would say, Holy Father, please, put a stop to this. Yeah. We do not need a, a now Rome to tell people, get out of your parish churches if you like the old Mass. Bob, what would you advise bishops who are watching? What should their posture be? I mean, on the one hand, I'm thinking that FBI document you just raised, there's a part of me that thinks Roche and company are basically taking names and addresses to see which dioceses, which parishes are corrupted by this filthy, dirty old right, and, and they, want, they all have a running record of who's who. Does it make sense to even plead the case and say, please give us permission to say it in our little parish? Yeah, what's going on, and Father said this quite eloquently, is it's the marginalization of people who prefer the traditional Latin Mass. And as we know, that this papacy has been all about bringing in people from the peripheries and the marginalized, but it's cre actually creating a marginalized group by telling them you cannot, in your normal, every Sunday parish, have the celebration of the TLM. In other words, we're now, I mean, I live in Virginia, and people are now holding Latin Masses in... Uh, industrial parks and warehouses and, you know, in a, in a few cases in shrines and whatnot. Th this is exactly the opposite of what we thought the Holy Father wanted to pr promote. And as I said earlier, this, this creates a division where there didn't have to be one. If I were a bishop, and right. I, I thank God that I'm not, um, but if I were a bishop, I would say that it, it would be good to talk to our other bishops in the United States and maybe pre present privately, it doesn't have to, have to necessarily be publicly, but privately to the Holy Father to appeal to his sense of fairness and just say, look, if people are telling you that in the United States, the people who go to the traditional Latin Mass are threatening church unity, which is what you basically say is the reason behind these moves, we're here to tell you mm -hmm. that, at least in our diocese, in our parishes, that's not the case, that actually people get along quite well, that either they go to the Latin Mass or they go to the Novus Order. I think that has to be explained in a non-confrontational but forceful way in Rome. Whether mm -hmm. it would make any difference, I don't know. But I, at this point, I just don't see any alternative. Dr. Peter Kwasniewski, we thank you for your insight also uh, along the way here. And Bob and Father, before I run out of time, the Jesuits issued further restrictions on one of their own 
a priest and artist, Father Marco Rupnik. Uh, Rupnik has been accused of sexual misconduct with nuns, men, and has already been barred from public ministry. In a statement issued on Tuesday, the Jesuits say they have received, quote, several new accusations against Rupnik since the story broke in December, and that the new accusations have a high, very high degree of credibility. So now, in addition to being barred from public ministry, the order has barred him from artistic activity, despite the fact that his mosaics are present in churches all over the world. Father Jerry, according to the AP, uh, 15 more individuals have come forward with new accusations against uh, Rupnik uh, of, of spiritual, sexual, and psychological abuse. The question is, who lifted his excommunication, Father? The congregation, the pope, both? Your thoughts? You know, according to canon law, that excommunication for absolving a partner in a sin against the Sixth Commandment, that is, can only come from the Holy Father. He can delegate it and has delegated it as an ordinary matter to the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith. Uh, so those, uh, it's either the Pope or the head of the Doctrine of the Faith who issued that, unless the Pope delegated someone else to do it. Uh, the Holy See has not told us who lifted the excommunication. The Jesuits told us that the excommunication was lifted the same month that it was imposed, mm -hmm. and the head of the Jesuits said, after Father Rupnik had repented. Well, I doubt there's any repentance because the Jesuits also just revealed that Father Rupnik would not cooperate with this investigation, which revealed, you know, when the word several's used in a press release, I think three or four, it turns out to be 15 people. So 15 more yeah. credible ac accusations made against this man, um, and he won't cooperate with it. You know, the, the Father Superior, the Jesuits, can order him to go before the tribunal. He doesn't, he can't order him to answer questions. That would be a violation of conscience. But he could certainly have the investigator sit him down and say, Father Rupnik, here are 10 questions. Question number one, what is your answer? Get it on record whether Rupnik will say nothing or will answer it. I mean, they've got to be forceful here. We're talking about a priest who over decades used his priestly authority to inflict grave harm on innocent people who were in religious life, uh, were treating this mm. as, as, as simply just a matter of history. No, this is a real threat, and the punishment needs to be given, because the community needs to know. Priests who use their power to inflict sin, their sin on, on an innocent person, they can't stay in the priesthood. They have to be removed if found guilty. Yeah. I hope that's what happens in this case. Mm -hmm. Well, it's what should happen. But the good news, Father, he wasn't saying the Latin Mass, so it's okay. Uh, Bob, the Jesuits are considering further disciplinary measures against Rupnik. Um, is it curious to you that this story dropped on the same day as the Latin Mass restrictions? And why the copious mercy in this case, but faithful families are cast out of their parishes for preferring an ancient version of the liturgy? You have a very suspicious mind, Raymond. Uh, I, I do indeed. I will not comment on that. Uh, look, I do want to say this about Father Rupnik, that this is a, 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 this is a case that even goes beyond, I think, the moral turpitude. I, I, I don't want to make a judgment until we have further facts in. But we've seen this in other cases before, of Jean uh, Vanier with Larche in France, uh, mm -hmm. with the, the legionaries. There's something that is demonic in what he actually did, and, and, and perhaps even satanic. We, there, there have been some stories that he used sacred vessels in these sort of sexual rituals with these women. At one point, he yeah. tried to get two women to have sex with him together. It, it, he said it was an image of, of the Trinity for him to do this. And this raises the question, then, what happens to the art, uh, his art that is in, in over 200 places around the world? It's at Lourdes, it's at Fatima, it's in the Vatican, uh, it's in a lot of churches. I, I've seen people say that they can separate the artist from the art. And it's true that artists in the past have been less than sterling moral characters. But in this instance, if you were a person who was abused or you knew somebody or just you know about this case, how are you going to feel about sitting in a, a parish or a shrine um, and you see these images that were produced by a man that you know was into some kind of deep spiritual engagement with dark forces. This isn't simply a moral, moral mm. failure, in my judgment at this point. I hope I'm wrong about that. But from everything that we're seeing, this really, it, it's part of the darkening of the, the moral nature of the, the postmodern world that we see not, not only out mm. in the secular world, but inside the church itself. 
And I, I think something radical is going to have to happen as a result. Yeah, well, uh, Father, I'll give you the last word here, but Bob raises an excellent point, though I am distressed that he won't comment on my, my curious and well-framed question, uh, which I think is based on some fact, but we'll get to that next time, Bob. Um, Bob makes the great point that as you pray, and this is kind of riffing on Benedict, as you pray, as you worship, so you live. The church is the liturgy, if you will. What does it tell us that a man like Rupnik is given all of this um, all repeated acts of mercy and forgiveness, but people who are attempting to be faithful and are fruitful and are, and are, are there every Sunday and are keeping the doors open are treated like trash. What does it tell us? And is that in any way linked to the way in which we are praying? Well, let's just say this. Sad to say, in the Catholic Church, you have the same celebrity culture as you do in the secular world. So important and famous people who appear on television and, you know, are art artistic stars and this and that and have all mm -hmm. kinds of followers, uh, they do horrible things and then it's covered up. You know, Massiel's accusation took a long time and a lot of courage on, on Cardinal Ratzinger to finally get them resolved. And even he mm -hmm. wasn't thrown out of the priesthood. Jean Vanier, as, as Bob mentioned, he committed a lot of crimes. These were covered up. Uh, when you are sitting in a chapel now, knowing that Father Rupnik is, was this basically demonically inspired sex abuser of r r women religious, uh, are we supposed to sit and there men. and say, but, you know, and men too, yeah, exactly, now that came out. Are we supposed to sit there and say, well, yep. he's, he, you know, his work deserves to be in this church. I think it would be a very good idea to cleanse the memory of Father Rupnik's crimes by getting rid of Father Rupnik's artwork in these churches, and let's restore some normalcy. And, you know, people not see action, not words. If the Catholic Church is so horrified by Father Rupnik's actions, throw him out, get rid of his art, tell the world people who misuse the priesthood will not be given the benefit of the doubt. They will be punished, and their artwork doesn't deserve a place in the church. Hmm. Gentlemen, we will leave it there for commentary by Robert Royal and Father Gerald Murray. Visit thecatholicthing.org. Uh, and the Once and Future Roman Rite by Peter Kwasniewski is available at bookstores everywhere. Thank you, gents.